Yeah, thank you all for coming to our tutorial, Temple Graph Mining. Um, this tutorial is held by uh, Agustinus Jonas, uh, Elise Appe, and me, Lutz. Uh, Agustinus can't join today, so it's just me and uh, Ilea. So we also use some interactive part. For this, we use Menti. Uh, you can log in or you can scan this QR code. And um, we will have some questions in between or some, this is the first one, some word cloud, uh, what is your research field? Yeah, I, I need to activate it. Okay. Sorry, turn on responses, okay. Okay, interesting, there's some, uh, some diversity. The others, we can come back to this later and uh, see if there are more. Answers. Okay, then let me continue here. So, um, sorry, we also have some website where we later will uh, upload our slides. So if you want, you can scan now the QR code or um, I show this or we show this later at the end again. Okay, I see some people scanning and I wait a moment. Okay, so this is our agenda. So we start with some um, short introduction and motivation of temple networks and discuss the, uh, various models and algorithmic approaches. And then um, I present the first uh, mining part, Mining Temple Networks A, where we uh, talk about connectivity, reachability, temple properties, uh, centrality measures, and uh, K-core decompositions. And then we will have a half an hour break. And after this, Elia continues with part B, discussing communities, patterns, and events, um, and diffusion and random networks. And at the end, we have two more parts. One is uh, briefly covering some tools and code libraries. And then we discuss uh, challenges and open problems, as well as threats. OK, let's start with introduction and some motivation. So. Um, our world is very interconnected, and we can use model uh, network models to uh, we can use networks to model objects and their relations. There are uh, many different network types. For example, we know social networks like WhatsApp and so on, but there are also informational networks like co-authorship networks, communication networks, email networks, and uh, others. Then we have the technological level where we have IP networks, um, like physical transportation networks, or also purchase networks like e-commerce and crypto networks. And the list goes on. So networks are um, actually everywhere, especially also in web-based applications. And uh, a prime example are online communication networks and social media which has uh, huge implications in knowledge creation, people's behaviors, information sharing, education, democracy, and the society in general. We see this if we consider that more than 60% of the world's population use social media. And um, 2022, over 70% of this global spending on advertisement was for digital platforms. On the other hand, more than 50% of the users are concerned about misinformation. And this, um, we see that insights into networks can lead to huge monetary and societal impacts. So what are typical research questions in network mining? We want to discover structure, uh, we want to discover structures like communities or do summarization of networks, uh, detect events or do role mining. In general, we want to study complex dynamic phenomena like the evolution of networks, how information diffuses in the network, and or like uh, opinions form. And the goal is to develop novel applications and mining primitives. For this, we usually need to design efficient algorithms because usually networks are large scale. And in the traditional view, we only consider like the, the networks as like these graph theory objects where we have just nodes and some edges between them, but no additional vertex or edge information. Whereas this, in the traditional view, we only consider static networks. Okay, but now we want to go from the traditional view of static networks to temporal networks. 
because we have the ability to collect and uh, store much more uh, network data. Because at the moment, we have a lot of uh, data available that is as timestamps. So we have some time granularity. And this additional information can be also associated to the vertices or the edges uh, in terms of like time dependent edge features or node features. So our goal is to capture the activity and the interactions occurring in the system. And this gives rise to new concepts and new problems and also new uh, computational challenges. For example, uh, here you, we have an example of uh, network nodes performing actions. So uh, you see this network here and uh, these nodes like over time have different actions that happening over uh, as the time moves along. A different view is that uh, we have uh, the network and over time we have uh, interactions between between users, for example, uh, liking uh, some like of a website or a repost or sending a message from one user to the other. And considering this um, these events over time, we have new um, uh, concepts. For example, we can uh, mine specific patterns that occur, or like we can take a look at temporal paths that um, allow, allow us to analyze information flow. We have different types of events happening in uh, time intervals, or we can consider the network evolution. So what are our objectives? We want to identify new phenomena that can be captured in the temporal networks. We want to formulate suitable problems capturing the complexity of these networks, and we want to develop new algorithmic approaches for this. The end goal is to real, like to analyze real-world data and gain novel insights. Okay, um, we use the term temporal network usually, but this is not a standard term because this field developed parallel in different um, uh, areas. And therefore, there are a lot of uh, different terminologies for this. So we now consider x, y, and we can replace x and y with these terms. So we have temporal networks, temporal graphs, or dynamic networks and dynamic graphs, or very often we also talk about time-dependent networks and time-dependent graphs. And some of these combinations may have some distinct meaning, but this is not always the case, and if they would have some specific meaning we mentioned it. Okay, what are some examples for temporal networks? Okay, we already saw online communication networks like uh, phoning or sending emails, text messages, but also economic networks like uh, credit card transactions, uh, trade networks uh, of countries, Bitcoin transactions, uh, but also bibliographic networks. Then, um, popular uh, human proximity networks, which can be recorded, for example, by Bluetooth signals if two persons are close to each other or other devices. Then uh, another example would be uh, patient referral networks or sexual contact networks. And uh, furthermore, a uh, prime example are travel and transportation networks, like you see this uh, airplane network or aviation network is a typical temporal network. On the biological side, we have brain networks that can be modeled with temporal networks, uh, other biological networks, or similar to human proximity networks, animal proximity networks. So how can we uh, represent temporal networks? We now discuss several uh, models. And the first one is uh, the sequence of interactions. So a temporal network is here given as a uh, this graph G consisting out of a set of uh, static nodes, uh, V, which are usually don't change over time, and then a set of temporal edges. And each temporal edge consists out of a triple uh, U, V, and T. And U is the start node, V is the end node, and T is the timestamp, which uh, belongs to a capital T, which is the time domain, which usually is uh, an integer or like a real value or the set of integers or set of reals, positive reals. 
So if you have interactions or transition times, so if this interaction has some duration, then we add an additional parameter lambda to this uh, temporal edges, which is also an integer or real value. And this is a lossless representation, so we don't lose any information. It's also known as sequence of contacts or sequence of temporal edges or temporal edge stream. And usually it's provided in chronological order. Then here you see some uh, visual representation. So on the uh, left, we have these, uh, the node names, A, B, C, B, and E. And then the time is on the x-axis. And we see uh, at time point one, we have an edge between A and B, for example. So a uh, different representation is a sequence of static graphs, where we have a sequence uh, G1 to GT, which are all static graphs, like conventional. And um, T is here an integer. And typically, we also assume that the set of nodes is static. Then ET are the edges that occur in the time interval T. And this is not equivalent with a sequence of interactions because this representation depends on the quantization parameter. For example, this interval, we set it to seconds or minutes, hours or days or whatever. So here you see some example. Uh, in each time step, we have a, a static graph and the edges are contained in the first time interval, for example, here, and then in the second time interval, the edges and so on. So choosing the right time resolution is uh, critical. So um, we do this by the quantization step. This is, we bin the timestamps into uh, time intervals of a fixed size. Uh, like I said earlier, maybe seconds, minutes, hours, or days. And if you choose a two course resolution, this uh, might lead mainly to a uh, huge information loss, but also leads to dense time steps or dense time intervals. And on the other hand, if our resolution is too fine, then we capture more of the temporal information, but each uh, of the static graphs might be very sparse or even empty. And here you see two examples. Um, on the uh, left, we see here uh, three different time resolutions for a contact network of 24 hours uh, and uh, one hour and five minutes. And we see for 24 hours, we see one time slice, so one static graph now. And um, this is very dense. And this doesn't give us a lot of information. So um, going to um, final resolution, we see, for example, for five minutes, even like with uh, visually, there are, of course, to be some of these clusters that might be interesting. So it's very important to choose the right time resolution. And similarly, you see here um, different graphs for a contact network where we have uh, the, uh, the date on the x-axis and the mean uh, the node degree on the y-axis. And if our resolution is too fine, the mean degree goes very low. And this might be too sparse for some applications. On the other hand, if you have a two course uh, resolution, we, we lose this information that these that we have these kind of waves in this data set. Okay, let's continue with some more models of temporal networks. There's also the time series of contacts where we have a time series for each pair of nodes. And this uh, time series just tells us if there is some contact between this pair of nodes. And this is also equivalent to our first representation. Or we represent the data as on tensor. Instead of a adjacency matrix, we add one more dimension for the time. And then we have some uh, tensor representation, which is also equivalent to the sequence of interactions. Furthermore, we can model the network as uh, this called time varying graphs, where we have uh, also a set of nodes, a set of edges between the nodes, some time domain, and some uh, one function that says uh, if the edge is present at some specific time and the duration at a specific time, which is also equivalent to the sequence of interactions. 
And finally, there are also stream graphs and link, uh, link streams, which are defined similarly. Um, and link streams, uh, the difference is between link streams and stream graphs. In stream graphs, the, the nodes are also timestamped. So the link stream is also uh, equivalent to the sequence of interactions. Okay, and finally, we have the time window graph, or also called underlying graph or projected graph, where uh, we create a static graph for a specific given time interval by taking just the edges that appear in this time interval. So we take these edges where T is an I, which is our uh, time window, and throw away the time and then merge multi edges and um, have our edge set. And then we use as the nodes. Um, the ones that appear in our edges. So the edge induced subgraph. So this time window can, for example, be also the complete time span of the graph. Here we can also add um, edge weights that represent uh, different temporal properties. Uh, for example, how often uh, an edge appeared between two nodes or the sum of the durations. And this is also not equivalent um, to the sequence of interactions because we might lose some information. Here we see an example again. So um, this is a temporal graph and then we choose some time windows. For example, the, uh, for the complete duration of this graph on uh, time one to time nine. And then we just have this resulting static graph. And we see that we lost, lose all the temporal information. And then for a smaller um, interval, we just have uh, from six to seven, this single edge here. Okay, so these are the models, but there are also much more uh, other variants. For example, we can have time intervals instead of time stems. We can uh, distinguish between directed or undirected edges. Uh, we can have multi edges, so with the same timestamp. We can have uh, time variant data at the nodes or edges, for example, labels or colors or um, like more complex node and edge features. Or we can consider temporal uh, hypergraphs, as we see here, for example. And all this can be combined. So we could have some temporal multilayer hypergraphs with node features. OK, then uh, let's discuss the difference to dynamic graphs. So dynamic graphs is a standard model that is usually uh, used in uh, theoretical computer science. And here we also have a sequence of edge additions and or edge deletions. The objective in, for dynamic graphs is usually to uh, efficiently maintain some graph property like connectivity or the shortest path or something else. And the emphasis is here on computational efficiency. So we usually consider the computation time per uh, operation. For example, adding an edge uh, and to see like how does it affect the spanning tree. So and this, so the dynamic graphs actually resemble the a sequence of interactions model, but the difference is which graph properties we study. For dynamic graphs, like we co only consider the current graph snapshot, where we in this example take a look at the minimum spanning tree. But for temporal graphs, we usually consider some uh, properties that span a time interval, for example, a temporal pattern. So in the following, we do not consider dynamic graphs. And then there are also dynamic graphs in network generation. So if we consider some generative models, like uh, the barabaji albert model, then we have this uh, sequence where we add nodes and edges into, this, um, into a graph. And this also leads to some sequence of graphs. So usually here we don't delete edges, but we just add edges. And um, so this here, the what we are interested in, how the topology emerges from a probabilistic model. And we are also not interested in this in our tutorial, or we do not consider it, um, yeah. Okay, and then um, another thing are the uh, graph streams. So the data stream model, um, we are given a sequence of data items. 
And um, the goal is to have a small number of passes over these uh, data items that come one after the other. That's case only one pass. And here, usually, we assume some small memory that is available. And we want to have also a fast computation per data item. And this we can also consider for graph streams. For example, in the temporal network, the sequence of interactions. So the incoming items are the temporal edges. And this is not a representation model, but uh, rather a computational model. So we can also use this for temporal network mining. OK, and then there's also a lot of uh, recent work on learning for temporal graphs, where we have different tasks like dynamic link and node uh, property prediction, graph classification, clustering, and so on. And uh, in this area, people use a lot of GNNs and recurrent uh, neural networks. But um, there are also extensive surveys, and we don't cover this uh, learning area in our tutorial. And finally, there are also theoretical aspects of temporal graphs. Here, usually, the question is, OK, if you have some, uh, some problem, some classical combinatorical optimization problem, and now we add some uh, time dimension, how does this affect the complexity of these problems? And there are some old results. <clears throat> for example, that the uh, uh, max flow Menka theorem holds for unit capacities in temporal paths. And there are also a lot of recent works uh, on different um, fields like uh, graph coloring, maximal matching, vertex cover, and so on. And here, usually, the question is uh, complexity. People introduce FPT algorithms um, for enumeration and so on. OK, so this was uh, the first part of the introduction. And then let's start directly with uh, Mining Temple Networks A. Um, and here we start with uh, a very fundamental concept in temporal networks, uh, time-respecting walks and paths. So a, a time-respecting uh, walk, or we can say also a temporal walk, is a sequence of temporal edges such that uh, consecutive edges share a common node, and the timestamps of the edges are uh, increasing. This is the strict version, and sometimes we consider the non-strict version where the timestamps are non-decreasing. And the temporal path is a temporal walk that visits each vertex at most once. And here you see on the left uh, a path that is not a temporal path because the timestamps are not increasing. For example, from A uh, to C, it's a temporal path actually, but going to D, we would have to go back in time. Where here in the second example, we have a temporal walk and pass. So here you see another example. Where we have um, a temporal pass from uh, C to B, going uh, at time two. Uh, from C to E, and then from E to D at time five, and from D to B at time six. Um, here's another example for a not time respecting pass going from C to B, and then from B to A would be backwards in time. So, two important properties that not hold for temporal paths in general is that they are not symmetric, not necessarily. We can go, for example, from E to B, but we cannot go from B to E. And they are also not transitive. For example, we can go from uh, B to D, and we can go from D to E, but we cannot go from B to E. So what can we use uh, um, temporal walks for and temporal paths? So as they are only increasing in time, in, uh, this is similar to information or disease, which also can only propagate uh, in time forward. So some information cannot go backward in time. And that's why time-respecting walks are um, good for modeling them. And we can use it, for example, in communication networks. We can uh, capture the possible flow of information 
We can use it in financial networks where we trace sequences or financial exchanges to identify patterns or uh, detect fraudulent activity. And um, it's also used in epidemiology where we want to understand the spread of diseases. And finally, in social network analysis, we can use it for computing centrality measures for ranking users, as we will see. Okay, related to temporal walks is temporal reachability. And um, reachability, well, temporal reachability is similar defined as in static graphs. But instead of using static walks, we use uh, time respecting walks. And the question is, um, well, no. So saying something like there exists a SZ walk in a graph G might not be uh, useful because the existence depends on the time interval when we look at this graph. For example, if you take a look here, we have some SZ paths between uh, S and Z. But if I now ask for a SZ pass that starts at time uh, three, there is no pass, or for a pass that arrives before time, time step five. So the um, temporal walks and pass problems and also reachability are always related to a time interval i. And if there's no time interval given, we just assume the complete time span of G. Finding all um, nodes that we can reach from the vertex S, we can compute it in linear time, as we will see later. Okay, this is a related problem. So the, the question is, we are given a temporal graph, a vertex uh, S, and we, the question is if we can reach all other nodes with a single temporal walk starting from S. So, and we have some, so what do you think about this? We have some, on the Menti, you can give an answer to a, ah, sorry. I, okay, this is the, this one. So what do you think? Okay. Yeah, okay, I think nobody will be surprised if it's not easy. Yeah, and uh, everyone who guessed it's, it's NP-complete, this decision problem. Even though the corresponding problem, uh, problem in static graphs, we can compute it in linear time. And the, the reason is that each edge, we can use it only once, because in a strict temporal walk, we cannot go back in time. So, and the proof idea is just some reduction from the Hamilton path problem. Okay, and then related to reachability is commonly like the uh, connectivity and connected components. So in a static graph, um, we have static connected components, which means that if we have a node um, in some connected component C, it can reach all other nodes in this connected component. And this is some equivalence relation that partitions the graph on the nodes. So uh, equivalence relation, so it is uh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And now we can, again, do the same, like we say, okay, we just use uh, temporal reachability to define our uh, temporal connected components. So, which are defined as a subset of the nodes. And then um, there is a temporal walk between each pair in this connected component. And then we can this also um, formulate as this question, given a, a temporal graph and an integer k. And then the question is, is there a subset of the vertices uh, V prime or V of size k such that uh, all vertices in V prime can reach each other by a temporal pass? And this is also NP-complete. And even in two versions, the open variant allows us also using pass nodes outside out of V prime and the closed variant doesn't allow us. So in these two examples, we have, uh, or on the left, we have three connected components or temporal components. 
uh, the, the red one consisting out of these four, four nodes, then this blue one and this green one. And we see that um, we here don't have uh, symmetry, for example, or transitivity, for example, A and B are in one um, connected component and B and D are in a connected component, but A and D are not in a connected component. And this is an example for the uh, closed variant of the problem. And here we see an example for the uh, openly connected component where A and D are in a connected component, but we cannot add any of the other nodes into this component such that this node could be reached uh, A and D or A and D can reach this node. And the reason is, for example, if we add B, then D is not able to reach uh, B from A because um, of the time constraint. So, okay, these both problems are hard. One thing that we can do, we can uh, use the time window reachability and connectivity. And for this, um, we use the time window graph. So recall that a time window graph GI for some um, time window I is a static graph induced by the edges that appear in the um, time interval I. And then time window reachability, um, we just compute the, uh, the time window graph and then we can, for some vertex inside this time window graph, we can answer the uh, time window reachability with a static walk. And similarly, we can compute uh, static uh, connected components in the um, for some specific time window i. And both problems can be done or solved in linear time. The authors also alternatively introduce some index-based algorithms in case for large-scale graphs. Okay, so we talked about uh, temporal walks and now we have um, time-respecting paths. So we cannot reuse nodes on our walk. It's like in static graphs. And some paths in the uh, static graph are not meaningful in the temporal graph. We saw this earlier. And here's another example, for example, going from A to B uh, to G to J. It's just a normal walk, a path in our static graph, but it doesn't make sense in our temporal path because we would go back in time. Now the question is, um, what would be an optimal path going from A to K? So we also have a menti question for this, but maybe you might want to look first on the on the graph going from A to K. So this is Okay, so there are, there are two possible, at least two possible ways. Like uh, we can go from A to C to H to K. This means we start at time four and arrive at time seven. So then um, the time that we are traveling is our arrival time minus the starting time. So we have uh, three time steps that we need. On the other hand, if we go from uh, A to B to G to K, we start at time one and arrive at time six, and we have a duration of five. However, we arrive earlier, so it depends what we consider as optimal. Yeah. So, and um, the reason is we can have uh, several different optimality, optimality criterions for temporal paths. So the first one is the earliest arrival pass, where the goal is to arrive at the earliest time. In this example, we would go from X to C1 to C2 and C3 and then to Y. Another um, uh, optimal variant would be to choose the latest departure time. So we want to leave as late as possible. So we will take this path down here. Then 
um, we can ask for a fastest pass. This asks for the minimum elapsed time, so the arrival time minus the starting time, which would be going from x to b1 to b2 to y. And there are two more variants, the shortest pass, where we want to minimize the sum of traversal times. Um, so this is the uh, lambda parameter, the force parameter of the temporal edge. And then this would be, for example, going um, from x to a to y, if you have some duration of one, and the minimum hop pass, where we want to use uh, uh, the least amount of temporal edges for our pass. So how do we compute them? Let's start with some observation. Uh, let PSC be an optimal temporal pass from P, uh, no, an optimal temporal pass and P is subpass of PSC. Then in general, P is not an optimal pass. For example, here this red pass going from S to D to B to Z has a duration of four because uh, we assume that we have a, <clears throat> each edge has a transition time of one. So going from S to D, we arrive at time three, then at B at five, and then at Z at six. And the duration is the arrival time at six minus the starting time at two. Now going uh, the, sub, uh, the sub pass from S to D to B, we have a duration of three because we arrive at time five, started at time two. But the optimal pass would be the blue one. We start at time one and arrive at time three. So um, we can also construct similar examples for other optimal, uh, optimality criterions. And this means in general, we cannot like directly use the Dijkstra algorithm. So the greedy approach needs to be adopted. However, in the case of the earliest arrival pass problem, there we have this uh, following uh, subpass optimality. If there exists an earliest arrival SZ pass, then there exists an earliest arrival SZ pass P, such that each prefix pass of P is an earliest arrival pass. And this means we can compute uh, the following way. We start at some source vertex X, at some, and we have some starting time TS. We uh, construct some array uh, that contains for each node the current best earliest arrival time, which we initialize for X with TS and for all other nodes with infinity. And then we process the edges in temporal order. So um, if we now have this edge UVT lambda and uh, T is not earlier than our current arrival time at some node U, then we can extend this um, path. And the current edge might be a new earliest arrival pass from X to B. And hence we update the new arrival time at V to the minimum of uh, its current arrival time and the arrival time of this edge. And this is a linear time algorithm. And this is also an algorithm that we can use for solving reachability. Because if there's one pass, then there's also the node can reach the other node. So for latest departure uh, pass, we can use the same algorithm, but we just do it in the reverse order. So we process the edges in reverse temporal order, and we add the interactions uh, to the pass only if they don't violate the temporal order. So for passes pass, we first uh, define dominating pass. And for this, consider uh, X is again our source uh, vertex, and we are at something uh, V. And then consider pass P1 arriving at V at uh, time A and started at time S, and we construct this label AS. And now consider a second pass also arriving at V, but with arrival time uh, A prime and starting time S prime. So if the following holds, if uh, our second pass started later and doesn't arrive uh, later, or it started at the same time, <clears throat> but arrives earlier, then pass P, uh, P2 dominates the first pass because the duration is strictly smaller than the other pass. 
than our first pass. And the, the, thus we can replace P1 with P2 and improve our duration. So for the fastest pass, we can adapt the streaming algorithm for the earliest pass using these dominating paths. And for this, we keep a list of non-dominated labels at each node. And when a new edge arrives, we extend the non-dominated path. Similarly, we can do this for shortest pass and minimum hop pass um, by just keeping track of the non-dominated pass with respect to transition times or the number of interactions instead of duration. And this also leads to linear time algorithms in the case of equal transition times. Otherwise, we have some additional uh, running time for sorting the labels. And then there's another class of uh, walks and paths, which are called the restless walks and paths. So here we have an additional function beta. That gives us for each uh, node some maximum waiting time at the node. And the motivation is, for example, uh, spreading processes of disease, where if I have a cold and at some point the cold will be gone, and I'm not infectious anymore. So if we want to model the spread of the disease spreading, we add this maximum waiting time, which is corresponds to the time of being non-infectious anymore. For example, you see some uh, restless paths here going from V1 to V2 and so on, and we have um, no waiting time at the nodes. Um, so computing a restless path is NP-hard. But if you are only interested in walks, we can compute them in polynomial time. Additionally, um, we can ask for some specific colored restless paths and reachability. So in this example here, we have given some uh, sequence of colors. Our nodes are all colored. And then the question is, OK, is can we reach uh, v6 from v1 with a restless path that uses these colors. Now, a different exp um, a different variant for computing these paths or solving these problems is using a static expansion of a temporal network. And this is a transformation of a temporal network to a directed static network such that a temporal paths in a temporal network correspond to static paths in the directed static network. So how do we construct such a network? Um, first, we make a copy of each node for each time instance. And then we connect these nodes over time for each um, node separately. And then we create additional edges for the temporal edges. So more visually here, we are given, for example, this, this temporal graph. And then we construct the static expansion. So first, for each node that we have in our um, temporal graph, for example, A, we now insert for each timestamp in our network um, one time node, A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. And this we do also for B, C, and D. And next, for each temporal edge that we have in our original graph, we add two edges in our static expansion, one for both directions, because we can go from A to B, or we can go from B to A. And we have a duration of one timestamp. So we go from A1 to B2, or we go from B1 to A2. However, constructing this network like this, we have a problem because we now make uh, one time node for each timestamp. So the size is in the number of time steps. So we have T times V, which is not nice, but we can fix this easily. We just use um, the time steps, the time steps where we have activity at the uh, nodes. For example, uh, we have activity at time step one for A and B and time step uh, two because some edge can arrive at time step two, the edge going from A1 to B2 and so on. So the times where we have activity are the starting times and arrival times. And all other nodes, all other time nodes, we just remove. And in this case, we have just a linear size construction. 
Another way of constructing a static representation of a temporal network is a directed line graph. So here for each edge, we insert one node and we connect two of the new nodes. If we have in our original graph, a temporal walk of length two. For example, we can go from A to Z, C and going from C to D. So we have a, a temporal walk of length two. So, and we connect the two corresponding uh, nodes in our uh, directed line graph. And here we have this nice property that uh, temporal walks in our temporal graph of length L plus one are in a one-to-one -one mapping to the walks of the static walks of length L in the directed line graph. And this means we can, if you want to count walks, we can use it by matrix powers in the, uh, of the adjacency matrix of the directed line graph. However, we have um, one uh, uh, negative point, and this is that the size of this uh, directed line graph can be quadratic in the number of temporal edges, which might be very large because the number of temporal edges is not polynomially bounded by the number of nodes of the term in the temporal graph. So, um, so we can use a static representation uh, like the static expansion graph and the directed line graph to compute um, uh, optimal paths for temporal walks. We can use them also for computing reachability sets. And these are directed acyclic graphs if the edges are, have uh, non-zero transition types. Otherwise, we introduce loops, uh, not loops, but circles. So here's another example for, um, or here's an example for a transportation network. And we saw already there are different optimality criterions. We could ask, okay, for the fastest way or for the one with the shortest duration. Another way to look at this is to uh, look at Pareto optimal journeys. So now we have uh, multiple criteria that we want to optimize. For example, here in this example, we want to optimize the duration of our travel, but also um, the number of boardings. And this leads to uh, Pareto optimal solutions. For example, we can walk and then we have no boarding or we um, decide to have use one train, then we reduce our uh, travel time, but uh, we have one boarding. In a similar way, we can also add additional edge costs. So now we have uh, five, uh, so we have a start node, we have an end node, we have a time, we have some duration and some real cost. And then we want to um, find solutions which are a pair of duration and cost. In this example, where we want to have a flight going from Bonn to Rome, we can have a direct flight nonstop, which is fast but expensive, um, or we go via Munich and then we have a slow but cheap um, travel. And we can enumerate all these uh, temporal paths that are efficient, so with respect to duration costs and polynomial delay and space. This means we can output the first solution in polynomial time and then the next one also in polynomial time and so forth. Okay, so now ta let's take a look at temporal graph properties. There are many uh, graph properties that can be adapted but or also need to be adapted for temporal graphs to be meaningful. And there are local and global uh, graph properties. So one, um, the example is the diameter, which can be, there are two different, uh, at least two different definitions. One is uh, the temporal diameter has the shortest latencies of time uh, respecting paths over connected pairs. And the, uh, we only consider connected pairs because in real data, there are many disconnected pairs. Or on the other hand, we can use a different definition more similar to the uh, static one where we ask for the minimum integer d for which the duration between each pair of nodes, uh, u and v, is at most d. Another temporal um, graph property is a network efficiency, which is the harmonic mean of durations over all pairs. 
And its application uh, is what is used, for example, for measuring the robustness of temporal networks. In this example here, at time step 150 of this temporal network, 20% uh, of the nodes were removed. And then we see that we have some drop in the efficiency where the, efficient, uh, the temporal network efficiency is computed in a time window. Then the, um, another popular parameter is the burstiness, which is defined for a sequence of inter-event times tau. This inter-event times is a time between two edges at a single node, for example, or between a pair of nodes, or globally the time between all time steps of all edges. And this measures the deviation from a memoryless Poisson process. So here we have uh, sigma tau and n tau, which are the standard deviation and the mean of the intercontact times tau. And then we can compute the burstiness, which is in the interval minus one to one. And we have a value of zero if uh, our process is just random. And then this is, for example, here in A. We have a value uh, close to one if it's a maximal bursty sequence. Here we see these bursts of uh, events happening in the network. Or we have a value of minus one where um, if it's a periodic sequence, which is shown here in C. Similarly, we can consider the topological overlap, which quantifies the persistency of edges through time. So it is defined uh, as this term, where phi uh, uv at time t is equal to one, if and only if there exists uh, temporal edges between uh, u and v at time t and zero otherwise. And this uh, takes a value close to uh, zero if many edges change between consecutive uh, time steps. And on the other hand, it goes to one or close to one if there, if there are many um, or only few changes between the, um, between or in the uh, temporal graph at many time steps. So we have a value of one if it's a static graph, for example. And then finally, the temporal clustering coefficient is just the adoption of the static clustering coefficient where we also have some additional interval i. So for node u, it's defined as the sum of the um, time steps uh, t and i of uh, pi t of u, where pi t of u is the number of edges between neighbors at time t of u. And um, this quantifies how close the nodes uh, neighbors are being a click during the time interval i. This can, has been used, for example, for this uh, human <coughs> contact network at the MIT campus using uh, Bluetooth scannings every five minutes. And here is shown the global temporal uh, coefficient for every day, which is the mean of the local one. And we see that during the week, there are higher values. And on the weekends, the clustering uh, goes really down as expected, similar to the holidays. Okay, then let's take a look at uh, centrality measures. So here our goal is to assign to each node uh, a centrality value. And the higher this value, the more important uh, this node is. And there are many um, centrality measures on static graphs, for example, the degree centrality, closeness centrality, and so on. And there are also many important applications. For example, identifying key players or super spreaders in the network, but also ranking web pages um, for which the page rank centrality was introduced, or the H index, which we use uh, to rank academics, which is also a centrality measure. So many of these centrality measures uh, are based on uh, walks or paths. And they can be classified in medial and radial uh, centrality measures. 
where radial centrality measures capture the node influence over the neighborhood. For example, we count incoming uh, or outgoing walks or paths. And medial ones capture the node's role as intermediary. Here we count walks or pa walk paths uh, passing a node. So, and the com or the idea for temporal networks is again just we re replace uh, normal static paths and walks with time respecting paths and walks. And this leads to a number of uh, temporal centrality measures where we see several here. Uh, for example, the temporal degree, which identifies nodes with high degree, or the temporal closeness that uh, identifies nodes that can reach other nodes fast or can be reached fast. We have the temporal page rank, which is an adaption of the static page rank, which captures a uh, concept rift. Then um, also the temporal cuts uh, centrality, which identifies nodes with many incoming temporal walks. Uh, the temporal age index, which uh, can be used to identify super spreaders, temporal betweenness that identifies nodes with many optimal temporal paths crossing them, and temporal walk centrality, which identifies nodes that can obtain and distribute information well. And choosing the right centrality measure depends on um, the use case and the data that we have. But there are many uh, further temporal centrality measures like the temporal eigenvector, temporal gravity, and so on. There's a whole list of further uh, temporal centrality measures. But let's take a look at these four highlighted ones. And the first one is the temporal closeness. So going from the temporal, from the static to the temporal closeness, we need to first take a look at the static. Harmonic closeness, which is defined as this term. So for some vertex u, we sum up uh, one over um, uh, the distance between u and all other nodes. So, and this we sum up over the other nodes without u. And ds is here the uh, shortest path distance. And this means um, a node with a high centrality has many short paths to other nodes. Okay, now to obtain a temporal centrality measure, we replace DS with some temporal distance. And there are, there are several variants um, of this temporal closeness, which also uh, is because for temporal distance, we can use uh, various temporal distances like we saw earlier, the fastest pass or the earliest arrival time and so on. One uh, variant is using the minimum duration distance. So D is now replaced with the minimum duration distance. This means the arrival time minus the starting time. And the use case is to find nodes that spread information fast. Here in this diagram, you see um, how some information spreads in a network. On the x-axis, you have the time step. And on the y-axis, the uh, number of persons that have obtained the information so far. And at the beginning, we have uh, 100 persons with information, which are sh uh, chosen according to their ranking to different centrality measures or chosen randomly. And we see that uh, in red, the temporal closeness leads to the fastest spread of this information in this network where um, the degree centrality is a little bit less good, but interestingly, the static closeness is quite bad. Okay, so now how do we compute the temporal closeness? We could call the minimum duration streaming algorithm, which we mentioned earlier, using the dominating path for each node, but this is not very scalable. So one way to improve this is to compute the top K closeness. So in this case, we want to find all nodes with one of the k topmost closeness values. And the idea is the following computation for each uh, node in our graph. We run a minimum duration algorithm to compute the distances to all the other nodes. And here we use a, a minimum duration algorithm that gives us a property that we can uh, obtain an upper bound CU uh, of the closeness of the vertex U. And if this upper bound is smaller than the case largest value, we can stop the computation early. And we see that uh, for especially for small values of k, this leads to speed ups up 
to 25 times faster than the baseline where we run the uh, streaming algorithm for each node. However, we still only find um, the top K nodes. And so we can only rank uh, a, a small part of the graph. If we still want to rank all nodes according to the temporal closeness, we can also use some indexing approach where we first compute some index and then use this index to um, compute this minimum duration queries much faster in the second phase. And we construct this, um, this index by constructing K subgraphs. So we, we find a mapping of the nodes to the K subgraphs um, such that for each node mapped to the subgraph, all the edges that we can use in a temporal walk are in the corresponding subgraph. If you consider, for example, this graph G on the left, and these red edges are exactly the edges that can be used on a temporal walk starting from A. So we assign A to the first subgraph, and then in this uh, graph needs to contain all these red edges. Similarly, for B and C, this graph contains all the edges that are possible in a temporal walk. And for S2, the, our second graph, we have for D, F, and E, all edges in this subgraph. So if you have any query for a shortest path or some optimal temporal path in this graph, or for A, B, or C, we can just use this subgraph to compute it. And then if you use the streaming algorithm, we will be much faster because we have a much smaller uh, input instance. However, computing this index is also uh, NP-hard. However, we can have some approximation guarantee for some greedy algorithm where the uh, approximation ratio depends on the topology on the graph. The good thing is that we can parallelize this very well and have then some uh, shared memory uh, algorithm with some running time uh, n times m, n is the number of nodes times the number of edges times k over the number of processors. And if we compare this to the baseline and to the top 100 algorithm, um, we have the following results. We have some data sets. The baseline is computing uh, the minimum duration distances using the streaming algorithm for each node. And if you use the top 100 algorithm, then this is the top K algorithm for K equals 100. Then we already have some improvement uh, of the running time, but we can further improve it using the um, streaming, the index uh, that we just saw. Okay, so we uh, took a look at the temporal closeness and can now take a look at the temporal age index. So the originally the age index was uh, introduced by uh, Jay Hirsch and it's uh, for measuring the productivity and impact of science. And it's defined as the maximum value age such that the author has published at least age papers that have uh, each been cited at least age times. But recently, this has been also used for quantifying spreading influence in static networks. So first, we can uh, capture this uh, definition more formally. So h is some function that returns for a multiset of integers, <clears throat> the maximum integer i, such that there is at least i elements in the multiset that s is larger or equal to i. And then we can define a recursive version of the H index where the uh, initial or the, it's called the nth order H index and N is always given here as superscript. And for N equals zero, it's just the degree of the node. And then recursively we uh, define for the node U, the, uh, the nth order H index as using this um, function H over the multiset of the n minus one order of the neighbors. And then obviously like the first order corresponds to the H index of U. Now we can um, adapt this for temporal networks where we first define the multiset um, uh, n of a vertex V at time T, which contains all pairs of nodes and times W, T, W such that there's a temporal edge from B to W, leaving 
at a time uh, not earlier than t and have a arriving time tw. And using this, we can now also have some recursive definition of the nth order temple h index of a node v, where we define uh, the um, zero case as the size of um, the set n at time v t. And uh, the, <clears throat> the nth order temple h index of the node v at time t, um, applying the h function to the multiset of the nth minus uh, n minus one order uh, h index of the neighbors at the arrival time at the neighbor. And this we can, can compute in a, with a single pass streaming algorithm for all values of n uh, uh, between zero and n uh, within a running time uh, of the edge size of the edges times n, which is here the order and the maximum degree. So how is this related to reachability or to walks? If we here take this example where we want to compute the uh, nth order h index of the central node f at time zero, then we can consider the reachability of this node in the graph. So this graph, uh, this node f can reach d uh, leaving with the path at time one and arriving at uh, time two. Uh, similar, we can reach uh, E at arriving at time two and so on. And then this continues uh, from D, we can go to G at uh, time five and so on. And then we can compute um, the H index by counting how many neighbors do we have that have at least this number of neighbors. For example, here we uh, have um, this set of degrees at the neighbors. So, and we have three values larger or equal to three. Therefore, the uh, first order H index of this node is three. And this we can continue for uh, deeper recursion steps. So how can this be applied? Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm not sure why there's now this. Okay, I'm dry. it seems like I can't remove it. Anyway, so how can we use now the <clears throat> nth order temporal H index? It can be used to identify influential or nodes that have a high ability to spread information. And this can be shown by computing first um, the ranking according the node's ability to spread information using some uh, spreading simulation, some SIR simulation. So this can be done uh, several times for each node, in this example, 1,000 times. And then we use uh, the mean node influence RU as uh, the ability of a node to spread information. Ranking uh, the nodes according to this, we get a ranking uh, as a baseline. And then we compare the, the rankings of uh, different centrality measures to this baseline using the Kendall Tau B rank correlation. So a higher value is better. And we see for this Malawi data set, also the temporal closeness has a high um, correlation, but also the temporal H index for uh, N equals 32 or uh, 64 have a high correlation. And this is even more prominent in the other two networks. So the uh, end order temporal H index allows us to rank the nodes according to their ability to spread information in the network. Okay, then um, temporal betweenness is based on static betweenness, which is defined as uh, this term. So the node importance of U is given as uh, the, the ratio of number of optimal paths visiting vertex U. 
So sigma SZ is the number of shortest SZ paths, and then the sigma uh, SZU is the number of shortest SZ paths visiting vertex U. And this can be computed with Brandes algorithm quite efficiently. And the, again, the idea is to replace shortest paths with some um, optimal temporal paths. And then the question is um, computing the betweenness values. Well, the, how, how hard is this? So, but computing the uh, betweenness is at least as count, hard as counting optimal paths. And uh, here we have some overview of the hardness of counting different uh, temporal paths. And you see that uh, for several of them, um, this counting is sharp p hard. So it's not, we cannot do it in polynomial time. Um, we have here the case of strict and non-strict temporal walks. And uh, so, but anyway, for the cases where we counted for in polynomial time, the approach is to adopt Brandes algorithm. However, there are more approaches. Um, first, there are more possible temporal walks and path types. And Rima et al. they give a characterization of properties such that uh, temporal paths are efficient countable. And then there are approximation algorithms, uh, for example, by Santor and Sapa uh, or Kosciani, where we uh, have sampling based approximations for different kinds of temporal path types. And finally, there's also uh, recently a comparison for different proxies for temporal betweenness. And uh, one of these proxies is called the pass-through degree, which seems to be a good candidate, uh, which is fast to compute. Okay, then finally, we take a look at the ten uh, temporal walk centrality. And let's first uh, define y in and uh, y out as the sets of incoming and outgoing temporal walks at uh, node u at time t. And then we can uh, define w in and w out uh, for a node and a time as the sum of the weighted walks in y in and y out. So, and for the weighting, we add some to weighting functions. With this, we can define the temporal walk centrality of a vertex as uh, the following sum, which goes over um, uh, the time steps t1 and uh, t2, where t1 is smaller or equal to t2. And um, we take all the weighted incoming walks uh, at the node u at time t1 times all the possible outgoing walks, the weighted outgoing walks uh, times some weighting function, depending on the time, how long it took between these incoming and outgoing walks. And this captures a node's ability to obtain and to pass on information. And this, now we can uh, use the directed line graph representation. Uh, if you remember, we had this property that the temporal walk uh, in our temporal graph of length L plus one is in a one-to-one -one mapping with uh, walks in the directed line graph representation of lengths L. This means we can now compute the walks uh, by matrix powers or using the Newman series with this identity, uh, which holds if the sum converges, which is guaranteed when the largest eigenvalue is less than one. And then we can compute it by matrix, uh, matrix inversion, or we can use uh, an approximation uh, with power iteration. Alternatively, we can again use a, a streaming algorithm where we have two paths. The forward pass is for computing the incoming walks and the, out, uh, the backward pass is for computing the outgoing walks of a node. And then uh, we have a running time of uh, the number of edges times tau max, where tau max is the largest cardinality of avail availability uh, or arrival times at a node. And here you see a comparison for a small um, email subgraph between temporal walk centrality, temporal betweenness, and uh, the static walk betweenness, which is similar to the temporal walk centrality, but doesn't include the time uh, in terms of just counts static walks. And we see that the centralities for the temporal betweenness are in general most often lower because it's more restrictive where for the static walk between it is less restrict, uh, restrictive and we have 
general Hayat and relative areas. Okay, so let's compare them again. So we saw the temporal closeness. There are many different variants. On the other hand, it's intuitive and there are several approaches for improving the computation times. For the temporal age index, it's uh, not very intuitive definition, but we are able to capture the spreading capabilities well and uh, efficient. The temporal between the centrality is uh, not very scalable and many of its variants are even hard to compute. On the other hand, it's intuitive and there's a wide range of approaches for improving the computation times like the approximation algorithms. And then the temporal walk centrality has a disadvantage that we cannot rank um, things or sources because a thing doesn't have any outgoing walks and the source no incoming walks. So we are not able to rank them. And on the other hand, it's intuitive and also efficient to compute. Choosing the right centrality measure always depends on the, on the data that we have and also on the use case. Okay, then um, we discuss some temporal core decompositions. And a K-core is a, in a static graph defined as the maximum subgraph GK of G such that every node in GK has at least K neighbors in GK. And the node U has a, a core number of K if U belongs to a K core, but not the K plus one core. And in this example, you see um, these blue nodes, they are in the three core because um, if you take the induced graph by only these uh, blue nodes, then each node has at least a degree of three. And similarly, for the green nodes and the blue nodes together, in this subgraph, each node has at least a degree of two. So these all have, um, all these together are two core. And there are many applications for k-cores and static graphs. <clears throat> for example, identifying communities or dense graphs, anomaly detection, network visualization. It has been used for analyzing the backbone structure of the internet. Uh, for network resilience and robustness, uh, studying of spread, uh, spreading processes, and also for analyzing uh, functional brain networks. And this is no surprise that there are many approaches for uh, transferring this uh, to the temporal domain. So there are uh, many variants of temporal K, uh, core decompositions where we see, uh, we will take a look at uh, these five, these five but there are many more variants of uh, temporal K-core decompositions. And here again, choosing the right one depends on the available data and the application. Let's take a look first on the uh, historical K-core and time range K-core, which are based on the time window graph. If you remember, so that we have a static aggregated graph that only contains edges that appear in the time window i. And then we can, uh, in the historical case, just find an at least k core in the time window graph. <clears throat> and for the time range k core decomposition, we want to find all distinct at least k cores in all possible time windows in time interval i. So for this, this we have to possibly construct quadratic number of time, sub time intervals. And here's some uh, use case example where we see uh, six cores of uh, Professor Jawe Han's ego network in the DBIP data set. And the first snapshot is for the time uh, interval or time window between 2011 and 2015. And the second one is uh, from 2016 to uh, 2020. And we see that the, the six core completely changed uh, between these two time intervals. Okay, to compute this, that we can use some uh, straightforward computation. We can just restrict to the time interval or the subtime intervals. Or the authors also introduce uh, some index-based solutions where that supports the k-core query for every possible time window and integer k. 
Then we had the KH core decomposition, where KH core is defined as the largest subgraph H, such that every vertex in H must have at least K neighbors in H, where each such neighbor must be connected uh, to V with H temporal edges. And here you see an example of a 202K <clears throat> of a 2-2 core, because each of these blue nodes uh, has two neighbors that are connected with two temporal edges. For example, A is connected to B and C and to both connected with two temporal edges. But this can also be interpreted as a core decomposition for multigraphs or multilayer graphs because these time steps are not used for the decomposition. We can just remove them and have just this multilayer graph or multigraph. And we still have a 2-2 two -two core in this uh, graph. Then um, span cores, where a span where the k delta core is a maximal set of vertices c, such that c is a k core of the complete span of the time interval delta. And um, this means that each edge of the core exists in each time step of delta. And then we can also define the maxim maximal span cores that are not dominated in K or Delta. And um, the author showed several applications for this. For example, community search, identifying temporal patterns, anomaly detection, graph embedding and vertex classification, or also a containing or maximizing spreading. And here's one example application. We have, um, uh, which is temporal pattern identification. And this shows uh, the temporal activity in a high school. Here you see on the x-axis um, the times and then the, the span of the k course um, on the y-axis and the color um, is the value of k. And we see the structures uh, of where the span reduces over time. But if we... Um, just reshuffle all the time steps in the network, then we see that these uh, cohesive substructures completely disappear. Okay, then finally, we have the K delta core, where we first define the um, delta degree of an edge as a minimum number of edges incident to one of its endpoints um, that have a temporal distance of at most K where the temporal distance is the absolute difference of the time stamps of the two edges. And then the K-delta core is the inclusion maximal edge and use subgraph of G, such that, the, <clears throat> such that each temporal edge in the subgraph has at least a delta degree of K plus one. So this definition is based on edges. And you see two different um, cores here, a 2-2 core and a 3-2 core, and uh, each edge in a k-delta goes at both ends of the edge incident to at least k plus one edges in the core with a temporal distance of at most delta. And this can be used for um, analyzing malicious uh, tweets in a Twitter network or has been used. And here we see on the um, y-axis the uh, number of nodes and edges in the k-core. And the k is the value of um, the k-core, where um, the k-delta core is computed for a delta of one hour. And then, interestingly, we see at some point the, the cores only contain misinformation. So um, from... Uh, 38 or something like this, uh, the course only contain edges that are classified as misinformation. Okay, let's take another overview over the K-course. We had the historical and time range K-course, which are based on time window graphs. So they lose a lot of information, but they are efficient to compute. Then the KH core doesn't really include the timestamps and can be considered as uh, K-core decomposition for multi-layer graphs but it's also uh, very efficient to compute. The span core needs a dense sequence of static graphs 
um, and it's not very scalable. It needs this dense sequence of static graphs because for a uh, span code to exist, each edge needs to be in each timestamp. And if you have very uh, sparse time steps, this uh, rarely happens. And uh, it has been shown to be useful in a wide range of applications. And then finally, we have the uh, K-Delta core, which can also handle fine-grained data and is efficient to compute. So again, choosing the right one depends on the available data and on the application. And this concludes um, the first two parts of our tutorial. Uh, thank you so far. If you have any questions. Okay, then I guess there's a break now and then this continues in uh, half an hour. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I guess we can resume with the, the tutorial and the part B. Uh, so the part B will focus, um, um, we'll discuss some primitives in mining temporal networks for community detection. Then we'll see patterns and events and diffusion and random networks. Then the final two parts are a discussion on tools and code libraries and an open discussion, hopefully, on challenges and open problems. Okay, let's start with the... Uh, B uh, and community detection. So a sentence that you will always find like in literature is that identifying communities is fundamental task in computer science and network science. And you will find like very beautiful plots like this one, which are really colorful with community structures. But actually what's a community? And a uh, question is what's a temporal community? Well. We will see, but it, the answer is not so easy. In particular, let's start from a static net. A community is in general an umbrella term, so it may mean different things. And there are many surveys like trying to capture what a community is. One possible general definition for a community is, for example, is a set of nodes that are close to each other much more than what they are connected to the rest of the network. or something like a community is a dense subgraph. So um, what are typical scenarios in community detection? We want to identify, for example, in general, a single big community versus, for example, partitioning the network in different communities. Then may want to have like overlapping communities versus non-overlapping ones. So for example, if communities are made of users, then of course a user can belong to different communities. And we may have like some local or global um, different settings for community detection. Great. So usually when you want to identify a community um, for data analysis, what you do is that you pick a problem setting. So for example, I want to partition the network in K communities. And then I pick a proper metric to then identify like how dense these communities will be. So for example, I can look at the average degree, at density, conductance, and much more, many more other like metrics. So once I have a metric, I have a setting, then what I do is that I look at algorithms. So if I want to use like a, a problem which is very studied, then I will use some algorithm. If the problem is new, I will design a new algorithm. And then I will analyze my data to Gay, uh, to obtain new insights from such data and possibly um, redo steps one and two. So once I have such community structure, what can I do with it? Well, I can do a lot of things. For example, for the analysis of social networks, um, communities have many applications, for example, in prediction, target advertisement, content moderation, and much more. We can analyze financial data we did. So for example, detecting fraud detection or many other applications, collaboration networks, uh, for example, identifying important groups of, of nodes that work together. Okay. So yeah, I 
think at this point you would be like, okay, but then if communities are if our communities are already so useful, what's new about temporal communities? Well, trivially, temporal communities allow us to look at the evolution in time of the communities. So as long as, as time evolves, uh, we have different we may have different behaviors of a community that we are interested in. So for example, we may have communities that grow over time. We may have communities that shrink over time. Um, and we may have much somehow more interesting behaviors. For example, we may have like periodic communities that appear and disappear every once in a while during the observation of the network that we have. Then we may have like, for example, bursty communities that emerge only a given time, time point and then they disappear. Uh, and really much more than that. For example, communities that, that merge over time or that split over time and, and so on. So then you, you may be wondering, okay, cool, but then are there any taxonomies that I can study to like look into all these different behaviors? So questions, how many taxonomies do you think there exist? Okay, here, I think you can answer here if you want. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think I need to activate. Okay. There's more three, three. Like setting us up for the answer being zero. Uh, but now I'm setting up for myself. Maybe it's on the other end. Okay, we, we, we got a one free here. So I guess that consensus. Okay, that's that's nice. Well, let me see. Okay, one free. Um unfortunately, uh we have a lot of them. So then you may be wondering, like, okay, that's crazy. So how can I deal with this stuff? Well, uh, the idea is that you don't really need to look at them because some of them are uh, let's say quite quite arbitrary and also they don't really help you so much, depending on what you need to do. So what I'm trying to propose here is like an underlying, let's say, framework that stays behind all these community temporal community definitions, which is similar to what we have in the static scenario, but with some um, slight and important differences. In particular, uh, when we are interested in identifying a temporal community, First, we need to start from the data that we have. So which sort of temporal data do we have? Is it fine grain? Is it coarse grain? Which sort of model do I have of my data? Then I try to pick a problem setting. And the problem setting is the one that we already discussed. For example, do I care about a single global community? Do I care about partitioning the network in K different communities or so on? Then I need to pick a proper metric to quantify the temporal density uh, of the communities that I'm looking at. So this can be done in different ways. And here you may account for the behaviors that we saw previously. So for example, burstiness, uh, periodicity, or much more, of course. Then you do the steps that we already discussed. You try to look into existing algorithms or you just develop some algorithm and then you analyze your data and you understand if what you get is what you expected. Okay. so. In the next uh, discussion, I'm going to present like some, I would say, the primitives uh, that try to adapt, uh, trying to to show this framework, and yeah, discuss different pros and cons of each formulation for community detection in temporal net. So the first formulation uh, that I'm presenting is this DFF finding lasting communities. So the idea here is that you consider a temporal network which is made of different snapshots. So you have different snapshots of a system up to time t. And what we want to find is a single global and dense community across all the snapshots. Um, so the idea is here, of course, is that time is sufficiently coarse-grained so that each snapshot uh, carries enough information. So um, each snapshot can be used for the computation of the community that we need. So now fix a given time t, we need to identify proper metrics uh, for characterize the density of the community that we're looking at. 
So fix a given time P, a subset uh, and a subset of vertices, which would be our community, we define the average degree of such community at a given snapshot at time P as the average over the degrees uh, of the nodes in such community in the induced network by such community. Is there someone that doesn't know what induced means? Okay, I assume that you know it. Anyway, it's like you are considering the subnetwork only restricted to this, um, to the set of edges in this community. So another way that you can define the degree of a community is by considering the minimum operations. For example, um, given a community and a given snapshot, then you, you define the, the degree, the minimum degree over all the nodes that are inside the given community. Okay, then we did this for one snapshot. Now we need to combine this thing across all the snapshots. So again, what you can do is you can compute an average or a minimum over the different snapshots that you have. So you simply take the degree that you computed in, in the previous step and you average it or you compute a minimum function over all the different time snapshots that you have. So then combining the two steps, you have these F plus minus, where plus minus are in average or minimum, um, which computes either the average or the minimum degrees over the different um, degree that you pick. Okay. So the idea is that given this graph, given your objective function, you want to find the subset of vertices that maximizes this function um, across over all possible subset of vertices. And the subset of vertices uh, will denote your community that you are looking for. So by looking a little bit at the objective values of, uh, of the function f, you have different interpretations. For example, you have f minus uh, f minimum minimum, uh, where you pick uh, you want to maximize the minimum degree across each snapshot uh, of all the vertices. So this means that the, it, it, this is a really dense community. Well, you may relax, for example, this thing by compu compute maximizing the minimum degree across the average. Um, sorry, minimize, minimize the average degree across the minimum uh, snapshot. So the idea is that you can give uh, an interpretation uh, of these functions, um, and each one of them captures a different cohesive uh, substructure across all, all the snapshots that you have. So then how do we solve the problem? Well, to solve the problem, um, the authors, uh, in particular in, the, in this formulation, propose an approach which is based on uh, some peeling techniques uh, developed for the densest subgraph, which I'm not going to discuss, but the idea is that you can compute this stuff in polynomial time. And according to some proper definitions on the peeling function that you, um, that you compute. So the algorithms are polynomial and they have some, at least for some formulation, they have guarantees. In particular for F minus minus, we are able to find the optimal solution for F Average, average, we find the two approximation. And for F A M, um, the problem is NPR. And while for F M A, the complexity is unknown for now. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the authors discuss that their algorithms achieve not so good approximation um, for the two uh, formulations, which let's say have high complexity. On this line of research, there is theoretical work that has been done. I'm only point, pointing you to this stuff. I'm not discussing it. But the fact is that um, there is some theory behind. But I think more interestingly, let's look at how this data, uh, how this primitive is used in practice. So the authors analyze some data coming from publications from the DPLP dataset. And this data is collected across 10 years, nine years. Um, and the set of nodes um, is made of authors, uh, and the set of edges is like publication that are shared across these authors. So by running their algorithm uh, on the this data set, uh, what we get here is different communities across, uh, of course, across uh, all the definitions that we have. 
uh, every color denotes like a connected component of the solution because, of course, uh, the, the solution is not required to be connected in output. And what we see is, for example, that some nodes uh, appear in most of the most of the cases, um, and this means that maybe they are really important for the community. Uh, on, they have a lot of papers, but also in some communities, some of the pairwise, if you look at the pairwise interactions, and then you find that they don't have like really many papers together. So I think this is a nice uh, insight that you can get from this primitive. So there's pr pros and cons about the, um, this first community, uh, community detection algorithm that I discussed. Um, in particular, it, it's a nice thing that it computes dense communities uh, based on degree scores. Uh, it's efficient, of course, for certain formulations and works well according to the data that you have. Um, for example, when instead, there may be some things that lack to this uh, definition. So for example, uh, it doesn't specify like for um, a specific temporal behavior of the community. So for example, it's not able to distinguish between uh, bursty or persistent communities, cannot really adapt well for fine-grained data. Um, for some, uh, unfortunately, for some uh, problem formulations, we cannot actually compute um, exactly the, the solution that we may care about. Okay. Next, um, I'm presenting um, community detection algorithm, uh, which is based on episodes. So in this case, we are considering a graph, uh, which is an undirected uh, temporal graph made of 10, 10 timestamps, like 10 timestamp interactions. And what we want to find is multiple and dense communities that cover the entire time span of observation of the network. Now, OK, we intuitively know what we need to uh, obtain, but how we do it? So the idea is that we need to formulate, uh, like to capture the metrics and the temporal properties that we care about. Particularly given an interval, we say that the induced subgraph uh, in the interval is just the graph, the temporal graph, actually the static temporal graph um, that we have in the particular interval. So we look at only the, the edges that appear in the given interval. Then an episode is a pair interval and subgraph uh, such that the subgraph is a subgraph of the induced subgraph in the interval. So given a static subgraph, then we denote its density as the number of edges divided by the number of nodes which is a standard definition of density that you may always or quite often find in literature. Now, the, the problem setting is quite simple. Given a temporal graph, an integer k, um, what you want to find is k episodes um, such that their intervals on which um, they are defined are disjoint and they maximize the density overall. So the sum of the densities uh, of the subgraphs they are associated to um, is maximized. So um, cool, this is a nice formulation, but how do we solve it? I'm not going through the details also because it's quite technical, but the idea is to find, um, okay, uh, an optimal solution basically, we need to cover the entire time span, and this is the first observation. So once we fix an interval and we compute the, the associated uh, induced subgraph, then we have that we can compute the optimal subnetwork that maximizes the density using the a flow-based algorithm, which is thanks to Goldberg. And then, so since we know how to do this, then it's sufficient to um, solve an optimal segmentation, which is a well-known uh, problem in literature. So the idea is that you can find this in polynomial time and you get your optimal solution. Are we happy? Well, no, uh, because like this is quite high running time. So the authors develop like uh, approximate approaches um, by combining some approximation steps uh, to reduce the final complexity of the algorithms that you get in. Cool, um, but you know, we care about the data. And uh, our last point is what we can we get from this formulation? So actually, um, the authors um, run this um, community detection algorithm on some tweets from the Helsinki region. 
where uh, the nodes of the network are uh, words or hashtags. Yeah, hashtags, sorry. Um, and uh, an edge is placed between two hashtags if a tweet with the, those two hashtags occurs at time t. Um, so they run this community detection algorithm with the parameter k equal four, which means that we want to obtain four communities um, and with some parameters that I'm not. Uh, it's about for, for the approximation, okay? So what we get in output is this, okay? It is not that the algorithm is wrong. I only selected two of the four communities that we got in output. Uh, so the idea is that we can effectively obtain some dense substructures and their associated time span um, which actually, if you look into that, since I don't know uh, exactly Finnish, um, they are related to uh, specific events in time with the associated time interval. Um, so for example, you can see in the first subnetwork um, that there are like nodes related, which are related to hashtags, for example, to Halloween and some DG Expo, which are events in the SQ region. Uh, but you can also find like in this other subnetwork on the right, uh, like stuff related to the MTV Europe Music Awards and yeah, it's cool. So what are the pros and cons about this formulation? Well, it adapts in a flexible way to the time span of the network. Um, it's, it is quite efficient to compute and it and actually identifies the substructures as we want them. Um, some of the problems may be related to the fact that some aggregation is performed once you gather a, a time interval. So then you may lose like the um, how nodes, the, the ordering on how the edges occur in time. And then it doesn't account still for different behaviors. So for example, periodicity, burstness, or other temporal behaviors. And also may not be informative when the time span, uh, the time span of observation is not um, really high, or there is not like really uh, dense substructures as long as you aggregate the network um, in any time interval. Okay. Uh, I thought we are at the web conf, so maybe you care about social networks. So then, okay, let us look at a specific formulation, which is tailored to social networks. In particular, uh, this formulation wants to obtain uh, buzzing stories, uh, which is a good name, um, uh, for a community. Uh, we want to identify like community, which are related to uh, something that is unexpected, uh, or like spreads in a, in a fast way uh, with respect to historical data that we have um, on social networks. So the idea is that we have a temporal graph where we have an old set and a set of edges and a function over such edges that evolves through time. So the node set can be made, for example, by messages of a social network or words associated to, for example, um, tweets and so on. Uh, then the edges are, of course, the, uh, the edges that appear over the, over the node set at a given time. And we have a function that denotes the strength of the given edge. So since I'm Italian, I care about Italian dishes. So here, like there's a, someone complaining about carbonara, which is not made in a proper way. So then we can assign to the different uh, edges. So suppose that the node set is the words in this tweet. Then we can assign to the different um, words. Uh, an edge, which corresponds to the time that uh, this tweet was published, and a function denoting the strength of, uh, the, of the edge that we observed. Okay, so this is our data. Then how do we model um, like the temporal communities that we care about? The idea of, okay, is that we need uh, some proper metrics. So since we need to make, to find something that is somehow unexpected and dense, then we need some sort of statistical uh, uh, property that accounts for what does it mean to be um, unexpected. So the idea of the authors is to map the input graph in an anomalous so-called graph um, by mapping the function f to a function phi, which captures uh, how an, an edge is an anomalous at a given time based on past data. So once we have this, um, then for a given discrete time interval and a subgraph of the input graph, we can define its density according to this anomalous graph based on some degree function, which I'm not really discussing, um, but is 
uh, if you're interested into more details, you can ask me. Um, and it's based on the BFF formulation that we saw. So the idea is that once we have one way to score the density of a single um, subgraph, then since we want to find multiple dense subgraphs, given a set of subgraphs, we need to score their density. And this is done with this delta. So we simply sum over all the subgraphs in this set S, their densities over the given time interval. And we're done. This is the problem formulation. So given an anomalous graph, an interval i, and two integers k and n, we want to find k different and disjoint subgraphs um, such that the size of each subgraph is bounded by n, um, and the density of the sum uh, of the different uh, density of, of the subgraphs is maximized. This looks a cool problem. Unfortunately, it's NPR. So we may not solve it exactly. Um, so what the authors do is they develop an algorithm, A, which runs in polynomial time. And for k equal 1 and n equal infinity, um, it can compute an optimal solution which is based again on some peeling techniques developed for denser subgraphs. Now, um, they use such algorithm to uh, output a solution to the problem that we saw previously by imposing further constraints on the size of the output, so bounding. And I remember you that we want the output to be bounded by this uh, in size by n, and to ensuring that the communities are non-overlapping by iteratively re removing the communities that are found at each time, uh, at each step of the algorithm. So the resulting algorithm runs in polynomial time. Okay, so looking at uh, how can you use like this primitive, particularly the authors analyze, uh, it's unfortunate that this covered, there was a Yahoo route. Anyway, um, the data set is about Yahoo searches. And um, the assumption, of course, is that if there is an anomaly, suppose I know there is a, something good or something bad happening in the world, then someone will look into it. So the idea is they process the data and um, they keep only, uh, so the, the data set, uh, the, the node set is made by words appearing in uh, the same queries. And uh, they do some preprocessing over data by removing like, words that uh, don't appear too much. And they map like uh, they remove stop words and the function f accounts for frequency. And there is so for, uh, further preprocessing to obtain the anomalous graph. So what do we get in output? Um, by running the algorithm with different parameters, which are i is the length of the interval and n is the size of the stories that we want to bound. Um, actually, we find different stories and their time interval, and they're associated to three real world, uh, let's say, events that happen. So for example, Cristiano Ronaldo winning the Ballon d'Or, some Russian prodigy winning a gold medal, and an Italian disaster. Okay. Um, there are also like pros and cons about this formulation. Of course, the nice thing is that, it, is that it's tailored to specific application. Uh, there are some interesting analyses that you can do with it. And okay, the algorithm is efficient, unfortunately has no guarantees, so this is a weak point. And to use it in practice, you may need to define this function f, which cannot be like so trivial. And from what I know, it's like not really used in practice. Uh, so yeah, hopefully uh, it will be used more. Now, time for questions, since I thought you were be sleeping uh, this time, hopefully not. So um, rank, uh, this is a new experiment here, um, if you want to do it. Um, it's rank, how do you think uh, for your research in general, it can be like these three formulations that I presented to you. Uh, hopefully you remember that, yeah, presented three uh, formulations. I'm not the author in any of those, so you can put a very low Quite low. But you need to vote too, so put the highest possible. I'm joking. Um, no. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, so yeah, let's move on. 
Um, next, um, I have some definitions uh, of communities, which are based on different properties uh, of of the of the temporal networks. In particular, uh, suppose that you have again like the time stamped interaction as a graph model about your data. In here, in this application, you want to find a community which is local to a given user. So where the user has the highest engagement um, possible. And this is a local formulation. I think it's nice to, to see. Yeah. So the idea is that now we need to quantify how the temporal properties of a local user having high engagement is modeled. Um, OK, there are some typos on this slide. I discovered afterwards, but I could not fix it. So uh, given a subgraph of the input graph, uh, we define the vertex degree of Wu as this should be the degree of Wu, um, which is the sum of overall edges in which the, the, the given node appears, which is the simple, let's say, definition of the, of the subgraph, of the degree, sorry. Now, given as a subnetwork, again, uh, the engagement of a node is defined as its degree uh, divided by the sum of the degrees in the given subnetwork that we are considering. So what's the intuition here? Well, the intuition is, should, is that the node should have high degree um, in this given subnetwork. Then we will make sure that the subnetwork is like tightly connected by imposing further constraints on this subnetwork. But the idea is that as long as this is high, this guarantees high engagement. So in fact, the problem formulation is quite simple that given a graph, a parameter K and a vertex for which we want to identify the, the local community, um, we want to find this H such that uh, the node is contained in the, in the set of nodes uh, associated to H. I remember, I recall you that H is a subnetwork, so it's made of a node set and edge set. Then the static network associated to H is a K-core, and this guarantees like the cohesiveness of the solution. Further, the subjective function, which is the engagement of the node, should be the highest possible across all such communities. Uh, where you can find H. Okay, cool. Um, to compute a solution, the algorithms, uh, the, the proposed algorithms are based on greedy techniques and some local search methods, um, which run in polynomial time, but they have no guarantees. And so I'm not really discussing them because I think it's a bit too technical, but we have some nice, plot, some nice plots. And in particular, um, by running again on the, the BLP data, where you have nodes that are uh, authors and edges that are added across um, for publications that are done together, by running, for example, um, the algorithm with these inputs, you get these outputs. And I think it's nice because you see that actually the, the resulting network is dense structurally. And also the node is quite central to the given community. So it has high engagement. Cool. Um, so there are some pros and cons, of course. The nice thing is that it, it's a local formulation. The, propo the proposed algorithm runs polynomial time, and the output has the desired properties, unfortunately. Uh, but um, of course, there are no guarantees. And I think that modeling the community in this way may be a little bit limiting, especially for like nowadays social networks where we have a lot of additional information. And the engagement is not really time dependent. So we cannot distinguish, for example, for nodes that um, actively like work into a community uh, only at a certain given time points or they have a different temporal behavior. Nice. So maybe you are upset because I discussed only degrees based on oh, oh, like degree based metrics. So what we'll see now is something which is related to a more, let's say, evolving scenario and in particular we have these snapshots of a graph and we want to find uh, some local clusters to a given node uh, that are tightly connected to the to the node where the tightly connected is captured by some high order structures which are these motifs that we are also this kind to uh, going to discuss in the next part so um, it's a nice spoiler um okay uh, we need to define the the, the matrix and the temporal properties for which uh, we care about our community. Uh, so in particular, given H, uh, which will be a small subgraph patterns, for example, an H, a triangle, a triangle or a star or something else. Um, then for a subset of vertices, we define its motive conductance. 
I'm not going to discuss into details, but the idea is that these things, this thing uh, measures like how, uh, let's say, um, how tightly connected is the, the given uh, subset of vertices with respect to this pattern. And the idea is if this is low, then we are happy. If this is high, we are sad. So that's the overall idea. So the problem is that given a graph, a uh, static motif and a seed node, uh, we want to find uh, um, a, a clustering of the data, uh, actually a cluster at, a, at each time point, such that the node is contained in the, in the cluster and the conductance of uh, the cluster is bounded by phi. So if we set phi to be quite small, then we are happy. So since it may not be so intuitive, let us visualize what we want to obtain. So suppose that H is a triangle, so it's like this way. Um, then blue node, the node insertion, uh, the node insertions, and green uh, edges, uh, sorry, blue edges, the node insertions, and green edges with the node removals. We start at time zero, and you see the, the yellow node is the one that we care about, and we have this cluster, these really nice clusters um, that breaks uh, not so many triangles. Then at time two, we have two edges that arrive. Then we enlarge our cluster like this. And then at time three, uh, we lose these edges, these green edges. So then our cluster uh, becomes like this. So we kind of cut it here. OK. Uh, the problem, unfortunately, is NPR for static graphs. Um, so the authors look at a, into approximate solution. So how is this done? Well, the techniques are spectral techniques based on spectral uh, clustering. And the idea is that you compute this multilinear page rank for like the, the high order patterns that you care about. And you need this matrix P, which is like the transition matrix over the motifs. And it's very hard to compute. Um, I'm not going to discuss the details. The idea is that the technique are quite standard for static graphs and is based on this whip cut procedure. Um, since we're we are doing it for time varying graphs and for varying t, uh, you can avoid from scratch recomputing the solution at each time point by considering, for example, the edges that are added and some edges that, that are far from your local formulation. Um, and yes, yeah, some smarter tricks that you can implement to have some something that is more efficient. Of course, the, the transition matrix at, at a given time point, uh, at especially at time point one, is assumed in input. So what are the strengths of this formulation? Well, it's a local formulation, uses high, high order information, and is somehow versatile because it, it by using the different patterns, you get different solutions. Unfortunately, it has no guarantees, and the problem is really hard already on a single snapshot. And it's not very practical to have the transition matrix with respect to the motifs. OK, we have our final formulation. And here, there's a question I, that, I mean, not a man here, but maybe you want to wrap. Um, so suppose that we need to cluster this data, uh, but we want to do it in a, you know, in a fair way. Um, usually when you we cluster the data, of course, you will place a cluster here because, I mean, it makes sense. These two sets of points are distant and far, right? But suppose that we add some fairness constraint, then maybe not so intuitive to you, but we may want to cluster the data like this because, of course, we may want to have equal representation of the different colors in each cluster. So bringing this intuition to the graphs, uh, we can formulate the, the clustering problem in a local, uh, in a local variant by identifying, um, so suppose our node set has H different groups, that we, when in this problem formulation, we want to find Q clusters at each time point that are tightly connected by this, um, conductance, which measures, is based on clicks. Not, I mean, the details are on the slide. They are not supposed to be uh, so precise, but anyway. Um, so uh, you you define how tightly connected is respect to the clicks, but you want also the clusters to be fair. So what does it mean fair? Well, if you look at the problem formulation, this means that for each class of the node set that you have, it should be equally represented with respect to the overall proportion of such class in the in the entire uh, node set. So, and of course, the cluster that you want to find at each at each time point, it needs to minimize this conductance, which again says 
okay, if this is small, then the, the clusters are tightly connected and everyone is happy. So the problem is already is NPR, then this NPR also for static graphs. Uh, the solution is again based on spectral techniques and the running time is quite prohibitive uh, because it's like exponential in the number of nodes and K. So yeah, it's really high. But let me show you basically an example. So suppose that we want to find Q equal to clusters and we want to cluster these, um, this data according to triangles. So we, we want each cluster to have the highest number of triangles possible. So the idea um, here is that at this time, at, for, at time one, we can break like here, the graph, because I mean, we're not breaking, uh, you know, on this side, you have many triangles, on this side, you have many triangles, but also if you look at the, at this um, node here, which has class square, uh, it appears one here and one here, and everyone is happy. But of course, if you need to cluster uh, the data by only optimizing the tightness of the clusters, you would do an, un an unfair graph cut here because uh, basically in this cluster, you have no nodes that are with a square. So what you need to have is that to place the cut here so that you have equal representation of the squares uh, in each of the two clusters. Okay. So, I mean, it's a nice application of showing like important uh, you know, topics such as fairness for evolving networks. Uh, it also finds global dense clusters and can have different applications. Um, unfortunately, the problem has no guarantees and it's already hard on a single snapshot. And also it, technically it is based on an, the enumerating K clicks, which is of course not feasible in practice. Okay, so maybe I, I thought you were like, somehow tired at this point. So I will do a summary about community detection in temporal networks. And in particular, um, I mean, it's a very wide area. Uh, I didn't present so many details, but I want you to get like the principal approach to which like many of the formulation that you will find in the literature are developed. So I, the idea is that you identify the properties that you care about the community. You search for like formulations uh, that, I mean, uh, try to model this stuff um, by, of course, like first modeling the temporal properties that you that you have. If nothing works, then you found a gap in literature. So you may be uh, willing to present like new algorithms or something like that. Uh, and then of course you develop algorithm or use some algorithms that are developed for the specific formulations. And hopefully you'll be happy because you'll find the insights that you are looking for in your research. Also keep in mind that many of the formulations have really like a technical definition, but in practice they are never used. So that's a, a gap that exists. So, I mean, I point you to some other references here. These are all the other communities, tem temporal communities that are defined. So for example, finding multiple maximal quasi clicks uh, that are stable over the time um, of observation of the data set and like many more other. Um, now it was supposed to be coffee time, but I didn't know that the conference, that there's no coffee time. So I take the time to make you uh, uh, some question if you want to respond. So one minute break, where in the meanwhile, you, if you want, you can do this question where you rank the formulation of how much do you think you like them or not. Just to rest a little bit, uh, 30 seconds, and then we resume. Um, sorry. Then we will resume to... Temporal motifs and events. I guess the Luca gives. Okay. Um, hopefully, temporal motifs will be much more fun. Um, anyway. Um, temporal motifs, subgraph motifs. Let's start from the static uh, scenario. Motifs are small subgraph patterns that can be used in, okay, some of these, these are only some of the applications, for example, databases, social networks, biology, commerce, and much more. But how? Okay. Uh, to answer how, let me do a short primer on subgraph isomorphism. Don't, don't be scared. It's 
only yeah okay so the idea is what's uh subgraph isomorphism well given a graph and a small target graph h this is a static graph by the way um given a, a and a target h what we want for a, a subnetwork of the graph g um we say that is isomorphic to h if there exists a bijective function bijection, a bijection a function f on the node set of the patterns of this target graph that maps into uh, the node set of this vertex set g prime such that for each edge in the pattern there exists the corresponding edge in the target graph okay so maybe with a picture it's easier for us okay so suppose i have this graph g i have this pattern h uh, then the idea is is this the induced subnetwork by uh, c d and e isomorphic to h well if we look at the definition we need to ensure that there is a bijection and I assume the I assume the bijection to be by made by these shapes over over the nodes um and for each and if I assume this bijection of course I need to check that for each edge in the pattern there exists the corresponding edge in the graph so I look at the first edge I'm happy I look at the second edge I'm happy I'm done okay this is isomorphic now question is this isomorphic like A, C, B, someone knows? Well, I need to do it again, right? Um, I assume the bijection to, to be like made by these shapes. So I look at the first edge, I look here. Yeah, it's present. I look here, it's present. Yeah, I'm happy I'm done. This is more. Now, we say that the isomorphism is induced if also the reverse holds, so for each edge in the in the graph, there exists a corresponding edge in the pattern. So, okay, suppose I want to do the same thing. I have this pattern. Uh, I look in the graph. I assume the bijection to be made again by these shapes. Then I look at this edge. Okay, I look at this edge. It's here. But then I also need to check this edge. So it's not here. So yeah, I'm not happy because it is not there. Induced and an and, and induced um, isomorphism. Okay, so typical problems. Um, okay, let me define some notation. In particular, given a graph G and a subgraph H, we said that the count of H uh, is like the number of distinct subgraphs in G that are isomorphic to H. And we also say uh, that uh, if it holds that uh, G, a subgraph is isomorphic to a pattern, then G prime is an occurrence of the of such pattern. Then typical problem scenario that you find in static graphs is, for example, obtain the count of a subgraph or list all of all occurrences of a given target graph. Okay. The problem, unfortunately, is NPR, the, the decision version, um, and is, it's extremely challenging, but it enables like many applications in computer science, network science, and much more. For example, you can use such counts to enrich like node embeddings uh, for malware detection, for example, or for spreading processes over networks. Um, so I point you to some relevant material for static graphs here, if you want to, I mean, if you think this, you're interested in the topic, but what about temporal motifs? I mean, for temporal motifs, it's even worse probably than communities, but what I want to discuss here, it's again, a way to see it in a simple way. In particular, um, for most of the definition that exists in literature, temporal motifs are made by three ingredients, three fundamental ingredients, which is a static graph, which you already know by the primer that I did, and by some temporal dynamics, which capture the way that, uh, let's say, time spreads accor according to the, over the, the static graph, and some additional information. So the static graph is here, the temporal dynamics model, let's say how this pattern captures time and some additional information may be like, for example, metadata that we have over nodes or edges through some sort of function that is defined over the node set or edge set into some domain D. So in the next discussion, I'm going to present two uh, of the most used definitions actually uh, for temporal motifs. First, the definition that we are going to see is this one by Covenant. Um, so we are given a graph by timestamp time interactions 
And this one, this one is a directed graph. So we need some basic definitions. And in particular, we say the two edges are delta t adjacent if they share at least one edge, uh, sorry, one node. And the difference in timings between the timings of the two edges is bounded by delta t. So let us see an example. If we fix delta t equal 10, we have this graph here. And we look at uh, these two edges. Then these are delta t adjacent. Why? Because they share a node. And the difference in the timings is bounded by delta. These two edges instead are not delta t adjacent. Because yeah, of course, they share one node. But the difference in the timings is greater than 10, if I'm correct. Yeah, OK. So now uh, we have the two edges are said to be delta t connected if there exists a sequence of delta t adjacent edges from one edge to another. And we don't require time order. What I mean? Well, look at this. For, uh, if we take this graph, delta t equal 10 again, all the edges here are uh, each pair of edges is delta t connected. Why? Well, we, of course, previously we saw that these are delta t connected. These two are delta t connected. But also these two are delta t connected because, I mean, there is a sequence that leads one to another, which is made of delta t connected edges. Then um, we say that a connected temporal subgraph constitutes of pairwise delta t connected edges. So for each edge, uh, for each pair of edges, there is a delta t connected sequence of, uh, I mean, there's a delta t, um, there's a sequence of delta t adjacent edges that brings one edge to another. So then a connected subgraph is called valid if for each two events that are incident to a node, no, edge, no, no other edges are skipped. What do I mean? Well, it, it's easy to see on a, on a picture. I remember when studying this, it was a little bit weird. So Fix delta t equals 10, and this graph here, if you look at this subgraph in C, which is not valid, we have that this is not valid for one specific reason. Well, um, of course, it's not delta t um, connected for some edges. But also, uh, suppose that it, it was delta t connected, we're skipping this edge here, this edge 5. Once we pick for the node C, 3 and, and 17, we're skipping this edge five. So this is not valid. It's invalid, so we say no, we, we don't tolerate this thing. Because for each um, edge that is picked, we need to pick the consecutive one outgoing from a specific uh, node, sorry. So in fact, this is a valid, um, let me remove this thing. Um, this is a valid uh, uh, subgraph. Why? Because it's, again, delta t connected, uh, and we're not skipping edges, basically, for any of OK. So now, uh, temporal motifs are defined by uh, classes of non-isomorphic subgraphs, where the isomorphism takes into account the edge ordering. Uh, what do I mean? Well, these are two different temporal motifs. Why? Because the orderings on the different edges is different. So question, you can raise your hand if you feel comfortable. Um, suppose that this is a delta insta, uh, like it's an instance of a motif, then to which class of the B or C does it belong? Well, to answer this question, you need to basically map the ordering of the edges on the pattern. So if I look at the smallest timestamp here, is this one, three. So I need to put a one here. So either two have one, but then I need to look at um, the second timestamp, which is this five. So I find a two here. So then, of course, the class, it's this one. OK. Um, so then the problem is simple, right? Uh, given a graph, a parameter delta t, and a bound k, we want to obtain the count of the temporal motifs on k nodes. Where the count, I mean all the, all the occurrences of, of the given temporal motif. To solve the problem, it's hard, as you can imagine. Um, so the idea is that you pre-process the graphs by computing some maximal components according to the parameter delta t that you have. Uh, you then find uh, the, the valid subgraphs, and then you apply some sort of canonical labeling. Uh, again, it's quite technical, so I'm not discussing it for the pur purpose of this tutorial. 
but I'm going to discuss a real use case. And in particular, the authors, uh, the proposals of this definition, they had this publication where they discussed application or real world data uh, coming from mobile phone call, phone call data. She, and they for uh, for each user, they gathered also some additional information, which was uh, sex, age, and payment type. Uh, payment type means how do they pay like the SIM card or something like that. So overall, they obtained 24 different node colors and the insights, uh, which nowadays I think they will won't be publishing this paper, is that there are some gender uh, differences in how temporal patterns occur uh, between males and females, you know. So uh, what they say is that, for example, if you look at a certain patterns, which is like this um, causal chain, for example, it occurs much more often when, for example, all the users are females with respect to when all, like, all the users are males, for example. I don't know why, and yeah, I think nowadays this should be bound. No, I'm joking. Anyway, so there's a problem with the definition by Covenant. Uh, what's the problem? No, I, I had a slide, but uh, maybe yeah, it's too difficult. Now, basically, what when we look at valid events, uh, we're not considering this triangle. Uh, so we have a graph. And this is not considered a temporal triangle. So if you look at, let's say, we want to count the motifs that are as a triangle, we're not considering this thing here. But this may be important, right? Because we don't know, and this is quite strict. Uh, so in practice, we may have that this is a precious information for our um, data that we need to analyze. So then the question now becomes, how do we fix this? Well, someone told about it. Um, so, um, Paranyape in 2017, they proposed a new definition of temporal motifs, which is more general and in some sense more flexible. And the idea here is that a motif, um, so for a given, again, temporal graph made of time, time, time stamped interaction, a temporal motif is a pair K sigma, where K is a directed and weakly connected multigraph that has no time here. So it's just a static multigraph with K nodes and then edges. For example, here k1 is this one, so it's just a path of length two, where you may have k2, which is like this multigraph here. So what is sigma? Sigma uh, models the temporal dynamics occurring over such pattern. So for example, with sigma one, sigma two here, we have that this is, will represent a time-respecting path, while we instead with sigma two and sigma one, this will not be time respecting. So time, so information cannot flow through such part, through such part. So now we define the notion of delta instance. So a delta instance is like an occurrence of the pattern that we are looking at. So how do we model it? Well, it's we say that a delta instance for a given parameter delta is a time ordered sequence of the edges of the sub of the of the graph that we have that of L unique edges um, that can be mapped uh, through the pattern on the motif by following the ordering of the motif and that occurs within delta time. So what does it mean? If I look at this data, so this is my graph, this is my temporal motif, then I to find a delta instance of this pattern, I need first to specify a value of delta, which is here. So suppose I fix delta equal 10, then I need to try to map following the ordering in the motif, each edge on the corresponding, let's say, uh, so for each edge, I have a function, I have two nodes, and they try to map the nodes on the pattern, on the respective pattern following the ordering of sigma. So if you try to do this, for example, on the first one, uh, well, you, I guess you are not able to find like a, a function that respects the ordering of sigma, and so on and so forth. So if we look at what are like the delta instances of the, this pattern from such edges, then you will find that only this one is a delta instance. And why? Well, because I can map T1, T2, T3, T4, and all the sequence occur within that time. Okay. So now the count of a motif is the number of delta instances of a motif in a graph. So the problem becomes quite uh, easy to, fr to frame. In particular, given a graph G, a temporal motif M, and a parameter delta, 
we want to complete the count of the temporal motif family. So the problem, unfortunately, is NPR. And if you care about theory, one poor result is that the problem is NPR, even for motifs that are in P for static networks. It's cool. For existing algorithms, the authors of this publication discuss algorithms to compute the exact count of these particular motifs. And the algorithms are based on this general framework. You compute the aggregated graph by removing the timestamps of the temporal network G. You enumerate all subgraphs that are isomorphic to K, where K is the static multigraph that you uh, have of as a motif. And for each uh, of these occurrences, you gather the corresponding temporal network. And then you apply a dynamic programming approach to uh, identify like the sequences that are actually delta instances of the motif that you have. The runtime is exponential, of course. Um, and the authors discuss some, let's say, more advanced techniques to um, obtain like the counts of specific uh, uh, of specific motifs. So there are other exact algorithms since this is a really flourishing area of research. Um, and yeah, I just point you to some references and this is an ongoing, uh, I mean, there are many publications uh, that are done uh, currently. But since computing exact count is often hard, we uh, may rely on approximate calculus. What's an approximate uh, solution to this problem? Well, given a temporal graph, a temporal motif, and this parameter delta, we, we want to, and two additional parameters in zero one, we want to obtain a, a count C prime such that the probability that this count is too far from the actual count is bounded by this parameter eta. So why do we care ab about approximate counts? Well, of course, they are in, in, practic in practice efficient to compute. They scale on massive data. Approximation are robust and no uh, to, to noise in particular. And we have guarantees on the quality of the estimates. So there are, again, uh, many <laughs> approximate algorithms, and they are usually based on randomized sampling. Uh, I'm not discussing them, uh, also because some of them are quite technical. I only want to discuss one issue about the definition that I propose. In particular, suppose that I have an application uh, where I need to mine some temporal motifs. Well, um, how do uh, suppose that I'm interested in this structure, but how do I pick like the ordering sigma to specify over the motif? I mean, uh, if I know nothing about the data, I cannot really pick some disordering. I may try different orderings and try to understand what's going on in my data. So in fact, in most of the cases, you end up like testing different sigmas to understand what data do you have. So in this paper, we proposed um, like a new problem, which is given a temporal graph, a parameter delta, and a static underrated subgraph H and the value L, we want to compute all the temporal uh, motif counts of, of the motifs that map on H and have L edges. So for example, if I specify a triangle and L equal three, I want to obtain and output all the counts of, uh, counts of these different motifs. So then I can analyze my data and I see, for example, this count is higher than the others, and I may try to understand why. Okay, the proposed algorithm is a randomized sampling algorithm and it also has some guarantees. And again, it's based on some techniques that I'm not discussing, but the idea is that you can sample stuff efficiently and you can uh, compute some estimates of the counts that you actually care about. Uh, so, oops. Uh, the idea is that you can use it in practice and you can obtain like different counts. So here are more than one, 800 motifs. And you, you can see like some of them are, have really high counts, some of them have really sm a small count, and you can may try to understand why this is happening. So are there applications of temporal motifs? Uh, well, yes, that, that's why I decided to uh, allocate a big part of presenting these, uh, these patterns. In particular, they enable like novel primi no novel algorithmic primitives and also some new applications. So for example, there are stochastic proof models about temporal motifs. So we here, what we want to have is like a model that captures the way that nodes form um, these type of patterns. And this is done again um, to capture like the high order uh, co way of forming such structures by the nodes. Um, 
what, what's the insight here? Well, if on financial data, for example, the authors use this approach to replicate, uh, let's say, um, how temporal motifs uh, are, uh, let's say, captured by the stochastic proof model with respect to the actual uh, count on the network. And you find that most of the time they're quite close. So this means that the stoch stochastic proof model is able to capture like this motif behavior. Then we also have like, for example, synthetic network generators where we want to generate some uh, temporal data uh, that is based on uh, temporal motifs. So we want to have the same temporal motif distribution in the output network that is uh, similar to the one in the input network. The idea is that we compute some properties and we use these properties to generate and simulate the, the way that temporal motifs are, um, yeah, are, are occur in the original network. So this one, then there are, uh, you know, another important primitive uh, that we weren't discussing is once I have a temporal motif, I'm not really characterizing how this occurs over the timeline of observation of my data. So this motif can occur, for example, uh, consistently over time, or maybe may occur in a short burst. And these two will have the same count. So it's important to distinguish between different behaviors. And the authors uh, define these persistent scores, which is a function of the width in which the motif appears, X is the motif, um, and the frequency of the motif, of course, and the, a function of the uniformity of, I mean, how much uniform is the distribution of the occurrences in the timeline of the observation. So what are the insights? The insights are that we can distinguish between frequency and persistence of the motifs. So you may have like really high frequency with small persistence, which means that the motifs occur in a short burst, while you may also have like motifs that are really persistent and frequent in time that occur over the entire time, time span of the network. So I think it's important to distinguish between these, these behaviors. Now, there are also applications to more, let's say, practical data, where you're trying to uh, identify phishing gang activities, um, and especially on Ethereum network, for example, you're using temporal motifs to uh, capture the temporal behavior of like the gangs actually trying to, you know, scam people. Um, and, but you can also use temporal motifs, for example, to analyze travel patterns in, uh, in commuting, uh, in people commuting, for example, with Metro versus bike sharing. And you see that, for example, some of the patterns are more frequent you, uh, in people that use the Metro when instead they're using the bike sharing. So for example, when you use the bike, it's quite often that you leave your bike in one place and then you take your bike from another place. Um, well, this is not so often when you when you use the metro. I mean, then for temporal motifs, there are, I mean, th there are many definitions. Here are some of them. Uh, they have been extended to multi-layer networks, to hypergraphs, to ego networks, and much more. Uh, so I point you to a survey if you want to know more. Um, since I think, yeah, this is a very important primitive. So now I want to tell you, stay strong, we are almost done. Um, there is uh, really two, two tiny parts. And in particular, the, the first part um, uh, this is about diffusion and networks. Diffusion is very important for temporal networks in particular, um, because it analyzes how information flows across the networks. And so this can be used in many, um, for many applications, for example, um, st studying how virus spread over the network, how information flows over the network, how ideas spread over the network, and so and, and much more. So um, what we will see is like the most important uh, community models, uh, which are the SI model, the IC model, and the LT. And these models by themselves actually don't really solve any problem, but they are often embedded in data mining formulations um, that for very important problems, as we discussed at the end that I present these, uh, these models. So in the SI model, um, basically what uh, it's a model to capture how information spreads over the network. So the idea is that you start at time zero where you have the um, one in one or a set of several nodes that are infected. 
And at each time point over the network, um, such nodes can infect um, or at least try to infect their neighbors with some probability P. Um, if a node then becomes infected, it can itself infect uh, one of its neighbor in the next time point. So the process continues after all the nodes are infected. Um, actually, this is a very simple model and you can enrich it by adding different type of nodes. So for example, nodes that are covered, um, so that can now not spread anymore the disease or that are, that are exposed. Again, you can study this model to understand, for example, how to block uh, viruses and so on. Then there's the IC model um, where differently from the previous model, for each edge, we have a different probability um, of a node spreading the disease. So for example, let's look at this example, which makes it clear. So we start from the seed node, which at time zero has some probabilities of infecting their neighbor, its neighbors. Um, so then suppose that it infects this node, then this node at this time has the probability of infecting these two nodes. And then, only now that it affects these two nodes, we go on as far until the network becomes, let's say, infected. Again, we have this model which substitutes with respect to previously, for example, the, the probability P with a different uh, edge probability, um, but also the chance that a node gets to infect other neighbors is a single chance. And again, this is used to study, for example, how, uh, let's say, ideas or products are can be diffused over networks. Then there are much more complicated models, for example, this linear threshold model, uh, where you have that every edge has some probability, uh, but also you combine such probability to, the, to decide whether like an node will pass from a given state to another state. So, uh, you sum over the neighbor, um, so over the, the, the neighboring edges, and you have also, um, you pick a random threshold for which you decide if the node becomes uh, infectious. Again, this has, for example, application in viral markers. So for regarding, of course, uh, all the many primitives that such models enable, um, Again, um, there are immunization strategies that you can study with them. So for example, understanding, yeah, what are the important nodes like to cut in a network to stop some spreading process. Influence maximization, which is widely studied. To select like seed nodes, for example, influencers. If you have a new product to sell your product or to maximize some sort of coverage over the network of your product being seen by the other users. Then you have also seed and cascade uh, reconstruction. So given some observed data, um, you want to find like the most probable way of the generating process of such, uh, of such particular data that you get to observe. Okay. Now, this is the very final part that we have. Um, in particular, common questions in uh, when you analyze some data uh, with all the primitives that we studied up to now is like, for example, is this result that I get actually new? Or is this only due to random chance in the data that they have? Um, are the properties that I'm, like, are there particular properties in the data that explain what I'm looking at? So usually to, to find an answer to this question, uh, you need to perform a statistical test. Um, okay, this is a very short primer and probably not really precise about how statistical significance is done. Uh, in particular, you start from data, you formulate an hypothesis about your data. So for example, I don't know, I compute some function, which may be a centrality value, a density score or whatever. Um, and my hypothesis, for example, yeah, okay, but for this primitive, the time that I have doesn't matter. So how do I verify or reject actually the hypothesis? What we say in statistical hypothesis testing is usually I generate multiple data, data sets according to um, such hypotheses, and I compute some function on each of these generated data sets and combine these functions in with some function with this function g to try to reject these hypotheses that I have. So then I may end up saying, okay, that this hypothesis does not does not really explain uh, what I see or what. 
So to understand the model, one, view, one way to view the temporal network is the following. Uh, we see the temporal network as a static structure. And for each edge, uh, static edge, we, we see the timeline of events of the different, uh, of the different edges. So this purple edge occurs at time one, times four, and so on. Um, so in order to obtain a random model of this data, what you can do, uh, there are like many things that you can actually do. So for example, you can randomize the static structure uh, or you can randomize the timeline um, of the various events. Uh, by doing so, you obtain a random model. So let's see some examples. These are really graphical ones. So um, to one of the easiest things that you can do is like shuffle the links by retaining the temporal properties that you have. So basically each the temporal properties on each edge is fixed. So you only shuffle the, the, the links that you have just by permitting them random. Of course, this is not like really interesting because it's not preserving many properties that you have in your original data. So you may care about, for example, shuffling with some constraints, for example, obtaining a connected graph in output or fixing the degree distribution, or even more, you can look at high order patterns. So fix, for example, the number of triangles in this graph or so on. One, another thing that you can do since we have time, of course, is that you can shuffle the timelines of the different edges across the static edges. So you fix the timelines and you shuffle them across the various edges. So this retains the static properties, but uh, and conditions of the observed of the on the temporal ones. But you can do even more fun things. Uh, so, for example, you can permute uh, each timeline uh, randomly, um, or for example, you can shuffle the events by retaining the gaps uh, between the various timelines. And you also, I mean, these are two examples. You can do much more than this. And you can also combine the static and the temporal properties. So you have many ways. Um, of course, uh, you can shuffle data, not only for the model of timestamp interaction, but we also have like for the model of snapshots, graph snapshots, where you can, for example, permute the snapshots, or you can draw a different snapshot from a, a graph that is isomorphic at a given time. So just a summary, um, like, Random models are of fundamental importance for testing significance and generating additional data if you are missing some for your experiments and so on. And they can be applied for most of the mining primitives um, that we actually discussed. So um, basically, if you obtain, again, a centrality score, some sort of path, some sort of motif, then it's important to actually ask yourself your if you're analyzing some data and you want to draw some insight, is this due to random chance or to some properties that, in the data that they have that may explain some such high count that they observe? And then, uh, of course, some of them may be hard to compute. Um, and there are so, I think, new opportunities that uh, need to be explored in particular, which is not currently done so much by, by the literature. So next, I want to briefly point you to some code libraries. So there are like some of the tools uh, used uh, that you can use. Uh, some of them are really easy to, to use. And on the, on the PDF, you will also have the links that you can click if you want to explore more. I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done and that should be implemented. Um, and yeah, but here you find a nice primer on how to use most of the, of the tools and the code libraries that we have. So now there should be a discussion, I guess, about challenges and other problems. But I guess we will just wrap up with some of the um, of the existing challenges in the in the literature. In particular, there are like many problem formulation uh, and variants, and it's really hard to understand whether like these are uh, how much or how is the degree to which they are actually useful in real application um, because yeah, like, I, I don't know, I think like mo most of the cases it's um, some problem formulation and some algorithms, but they are not like used by the communities of people actually using such uh, such primitives. Then there are some gaps in the, in the theoretical foundations. 
um, in particular because many of the, like some of the formulation that we saw are a combination of several ideas from static cases uh, and they require like many parameters. Um, and also sometimes um, another important problem is for example, for community detection, it's really hard to compare different uh, formulations because um, there are no really like, let's say metrics, uh, which is also the next point, uh, but also there are a few data sets where you have ground truth solution um, and also synthetic network generators may work for specific uh, problems that you have, but usually it's, um, they don't work for every definition that you have. And this, they are somehow interconnected problems. Plus also there are no standards uh, and benchmarks, of course. And yeah, um, probably having more data and uh, having more structured approach can be helpful. And in particular, we want to point some directions for temporal network mining. I mean, every every one of these challenges, of course, uh, it uh, contributes to a new direction. But also, we want to encourage, for example, a more um, like systematic approach uh, to provide guarantees on the algorithms that are being developed. Uh, we also want to um, like point. Uh, to have more interpretable results because for most of the primitives that we observe, we can quantify with some scores, but then if you have to use it in practice, then it may be hard. It may not be easy to interpret like what's a dense formulation or what are like dense communities. Um, and then diversity and fairness are quite important for temporal networks. And most of the application that currently exists are based on static extensions um, of yeah, data mining algorithms. Um, but of course, there should be more tailored uh, applications for these uh, topics for diversity of fairness. And finally, um, we need to encourage inter in interdisciplinary research between uh, and collaborations between, because like, as I, as I was saying previously, most of such formulation are proposed, but are never used like in real applications. Um, and, especially also in computational social science. So we want to thank you uh, for, I guess, attending the tutorial. Um, and I hope, um, yeah, we leave our website here, uh, our contacts, and like feel free to interact with us if you have questions, if you want to know more about uh, stuff related to temporal networks. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining our tutorial. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. We will post the slides on our website uh, so you can check them if needed and yeah, have all the all the related uh,